In this lecture on contemporary applications of anthropological concepts, Dr. Monique borgerhoff mulder presents several examples of topics and research areas that are currently explored in environmental anthropology. She starts with biodiversity and lays out the different lenses that different actors bring to the definition of biodiversity and its social benefits. She connects biodiversity to the idea of environmentally noble savages, that indigenous people are synonymous with conservation, and highlights the complex relationship between cultural and biological diversity. She then focuses on traditional ecological knowledge as a topic within which many assumptions are made, and argues that it is not static over time or necessarily aligned with the scale of environmental change. Finally, she uses examples of the tragedy of the commons and the opposite idea, protected areas for conservation, and notes that anthropologists have critiqued assumptions in each of these approaches to understanding environmental problems. This is somewhat of a kind of um, cartoon talk uh, in that I've uh, picked on, on sort of hot issues. Um, I'm going to address them in no particular order or rationale, and I won't have time to press them all. And what I really would like to have done is have you press buttons and then I talk them, but I don't have the technological expertise. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with uh, which button? With uh, biodiversity. And I don't pre presume to teach any of the ecologists anything they don't know about biodiversity. Uh, my goal here is simply to showcase something that anthropologists are rather good at, and that's dissecting terms and concepts. Um, and so I'm going to do that and then uh, present uh, the, uh, particularly the, the postdocs here with a challenge. So uh, biodiversity, uh, obviously a term that originated with uh, Sule and E.O. Wilson, uh, was defined uh, by OTA to capture species number, richness, endemism, and the processes that, that uh, the ecological processes underlying the diversity. And of course, ecologists have multiple indices for, for uh, biodiversity. However, uh, within a, a decade of this neologism being introduced, I think it was in the early 1980s, uh, there was, the term was hijacked by all different kinds of people as a bandwagon onto which they could attach their various agenda. And I'm just going to go through some of these. Uh, first of all, uh, plant, plant breeders were particularly interested in the germplasm um, that exists in, in biodiversity, uh, obviously with the rationale of ensuring crops against disease and uh, uh, drought tolerance. Uh, ethnobotanists and anthropologists uh, were particularly interested in the uh, diverse traditional ecological knowledge around uh, these diverse species and emphasize the importance of this knowledge to sustaining complex stable agrosystems and plant use. And of course, pharmaceutical companies were interested in the genetic resources, the, the option values uh, of some of this biodiversity um, to make uh, new products, cures, and make money. But it goes on. Uh, indigenous people, uh, with anthropologists often with them, uh, very much uh, emphasize links between biodiversity and cultural diversity, uh, stressing, uh, at least originally, I'm going to come back to this, the role of indigenous people as guardians of biodiversity. And human rights activists, again, um, often anthropologists, would focus on powerless constituencies, often what they called forest people or people living in remote areas uh, who were um, uh, important, who, who were living in areas of high biodiversity and again were seen as important guardians of these areas. Uh, the food industry uh, obviously was very interested in biodiversity, stressing the importance of, of uh, organic, uh, at least crops that were said to be grown in, in organic complex uh, mosaics of biodiversity, uh, obviously with rationales that are, are partly financial. Uh, rock stars, media, were, you know, we all have the image of Sting standing there, you know, sort of wild, you know, but a uh, wild, tough guy. I can stand together with these Kayapo guys, but, um, you know, I have great social responsibility and no doubt this uh, stimulated uh, uh, his, his uh, marketability. And then, of course, tourist companies emphasizing unspoiled nature and biodiversity and using this to sell holidays. And finally, of course, national governments emphasize the importance of remote, undeveloped wildernesses, uh, often um, nowadays to sell uh, conservation concessions or carbon credits. And uh, uh, bilateral agency, NGOs, uh, other kinds of development organizations, uh, recognizing that you really can't expect uh, local communities to protect their biodiversity if they aren't able to feed themselves, would emphasize the links between human welfare and biodiversity and uh, start to uh, design projects which, which link the two, which of course we're all very familiar with now. <laughs> 
So when you use the term biodiversity, you use it at your peril. Everybody is going to understand you differently. And the challenge I'd like to uh, raise to the postdocs here is uh, what about the term sustainability? I'm sure that you could do a much better job than I've done here um, by trying to dissect all the different ways and the interests of people uh, using that term. So uh, this is really a cartoon talk. I'm going to jump from one thing to another. Probably some topics will totally bore you. Uh, you can just phase out for those or wish that I would push another button. button. <laughs> Now I'm going to push the environmentally noble savage button, which has been alluded to a little bit this morning. Um, and the, uh, the view here, this is this picture again. It seems to be part of human nature um, for humans to romanticize the past. In fact, uh, Rousseau, uh, whose pe picture uh, th this is, uh, unlike Gauguin, who, who painted many uh, of this sort of naive style of uh, naive primitivism style at the same time, I believe uh, Rousseau never actually traveled out of France. This was just his perception of how wonderful these uh, tropical islands are, at least if you're a Frenchman. So uh, there's, there's a, the philosophical uh, roots uh, of this notion um, are really lie in an idealized European vision of the traditional or primitive um, exemplified in the painting of, paintings of Rousseau and Gauguin, but it had its roots in early chroniclers of Latin America and um, embodies all these ideas of, of romanticism, the land belongs to you, uh, to all, just like the sun and water, mine and thine, a golden age, open gardens, no judges, no books, all, all of these kinds of uh, notions that people lived in harmony with their surroundings. And this view was picked up by, has been picked up by social scientists um, even quite recently. Uh, this is a, a quote that I took from Arispin and uh, Velasquez, that this idea of a kind of functional interdependence that population level is somehow maintained uh, uh, in, in, uh, in harmony with the uh, natural resources available. And of course, got picked up by, by numerous uh, conservation development organizations. So WWF had a report about indigenous people's management, which they called the Once and Future Resource Managers. And some uh, indigenous communities themselves um, have adopted this stereotype. Uh, so Simbotwe, we see here, we Africans long ago develop, developed wildlife conservation customs compat compatible with sustained production, embracing soils, plants, water, and animals. However, um, there has been a kickback, not surprisingly. Uh, so we have Pama uh, the leader of Pamaski in Panama saying, I don't believe you can say all indigenous people are conservationists. We aren't nature lovers. At no time have indigenous people included the concept of conservation and ecology in the traditional vocabulary. And uh, even better, uh, uh, Terena, why do you white people expect us Indians to agree on how to use our forests? You don't even agree among yourselves how to protect your environment. So you can see there's kind of a murky um, and very uh, sort of staccato history here to this concept. So um, much as anthropology uh, as a discipline abhors the kind of essentialization in the noble, stere the, the noble savage stereotype, um, they have to some extent been complicit in supporting uh, both sides. And uh, I think Paige was, uh, the idea of complicity was, was uh, very central to her presentation this morning. And here, uh, certainly not wanting to blame uh, Marc Chapin, but because he's actually d done some fantastic work. But here he is collaborating with um, National Geographic Society, showing a really nice map of Central America, which shows how the indigenous people tend to live in the areas that harbor the greatest uh, biodiversity. And we've been complicit in other ways. This was a very famous uh, study uh, done in the, gosh, 1970s, I think, by um, Mos yeah, 75 by Moserman and Martin, showing how, or arguing that from this model, that indigenous people uh, could have been responsible for the uh, basically the blitzkrieg of um, loss of large mammals, uh, well, lots of different species of mammals in South America, in, in North and South America. Uh, they modeled the arrival of indigenous communities, uh, of people, the first uh, people in 
then thought to be around about uh, 1,200 years ago. And basically, with relatively reasonable uh, assumptions about uh, the demographic parameters of the human population and the prey population and the amount that the humans would be having to eat, they basically showed that humans could have eaten their way all the way from North America to the southern tip of South America in a thousand years, which is what at the time the archaeology suggested they had done, and therefore sort of pointing the finger at uh, humans for being responsible for the loss of 73% of large mammals and 80% uh, of the loss of large mammals in South America. So uh, where do we stand in the, with this literature now? Um, they're both empirical and philosophical stances. On the philosophical side, uh, we need to be extremely uh, careful of the naturalist fallacy, just because some indigenous groups may undoubtedly have driven some species lo locally extinct. This says nothing about inherent nature or moral capacity. In some cases, indigenous communities are clearly the best defenders of their land. Uh, I know that um, Eduardo has, has written a lot about that. And in some cases, it may be in their best interest to destroy their natural resource base. So we shouldn't be uh, making generalizations like this. And uh, this is um, a picture of uh, Chief Seattle, not... not um, not uh, Ali Stearman. Uh, the reason I have Ali Stearman there is that she wrote a really nice paper about the problems of, of uh, uh, essentializing uh, indigenous peoples with respect to the ecological noble savage idea. Um, but I have Chief Seattle out there because he is obviously somebody about whom uh, enormous amount of uh, mythology has, has developed. Um, but so, so that's kind of the philosophical side. But in terms of the um, data, uh, we now have much more evidence um, than Martin and Moseman could have uh, understood um, uh, when they wrote their, when they developed their model in, in 1975. I've got um, no time to take you through all of the studies, but this is a nice paper which, at least for 2004, and that they've done a, a more recent one of this, shows the role of indigenous people, how we understand the role of, of humans in um, contributing to uh, mass extinctions in uh, human history. So you can see, so what we have here is the black is the date that the, uh, <laughs> the black is, is when the uh, humans arrived, uh, the yellow is well-dated extinctions, the blue is times of climate change. And so you can see that in some parts of the world, I can't see from this angle, but you can see that in some parts of the world, uh, human arrival was clearly associated with well-dated, that's uh, the green, sorry, the robust evidence of extinctions. And the, that, so particularly in, in North America, we see that. Um, but, but in other cases, uh, for example, and also there's good evidence in Australia that the arrival of humans was, was uh, pretty uh, uh, coincidental with, or at least occurred at the same time, as the, arrive, uh, as the disappearance of many of these species. Uh, but in Europe and uh, Africa, uh, the pattern is very different. And so this led someone like Bernie to, to conclude um, that humans may have been a key, key ingredient in a complicated and fatal recipe for mass extinction. So just to summarize this then, um, the effects of humans on biodiversity, sort of going back to this ecological noble savage idea, obviously vary enormously over time and space. Um, it can be uh, very positive. So for example, we have areas, uh, for example, in, in West Africa, where patches of forest are clearly a consequence of uh, human farming practices. And those patches of forest now harbor uh, um, a lot of biodiversity. Um, it was similar, I think, with the terra preta uh, soils uh, in some of Sweden, Amazon, where clearly anthropogenic factors are, are contributing to, to biodiversity. And we also have plenty of evidence of negative effects, uh, for in some cases overstocking with wildlife, um, and some of the cascades of environmental changes that result from, from burning. But the point is, is that these effects are variable, they vary over time and space, they're not, inherent, uh, not an inherent trait of a population, and they're strongly affected um, by circumstance, ecology, history, politics, markets, all the kinds of things that I'm sure we'll talk about uh, much more uh, in the next couple of days. And, and finally, just a point to stress is that failure to live up to the ecological noble savage uh, stereotype is, in any case, never grounds to justify um, removing uh, uh, communities, populations uh, from, from their original lands. So another button. <laughs>
We're now going to talk about uh, cultural and biological diversity, which is actually um, quite closely related to the, the previous uh, topic. Um, so the homelands, right, so this was the map that, that Chapin was working on with the, Mark Chapin was working on with the National Geographic Society. He showed that the homelands of Indians, uh, of Indians in Central America, the jagged volcanic highlands of Guatemala and the heavily forested Caribbean coast are where both kinds of, bio, uh, both kinds of diversity persist. Um, unlike in the developed Pacific side of the, of the uh, land there, which is basically shorn of, of um, natural vegetation and, of course, of its uh, indigenous populations. And these kinds of correlational studies immediately raise questions of causality. And they're basically three different hypotheses that can be uh, entertained. The first is that cultural diversity enhances biological diversity. Um, and th so this is the idea that uh, small scale traditional indigenous groups uh, are responsible for protecting biodiversity. Well, I've just sort of de debunked the ecological noble savage uh, hypothesis, but I'm going to spend more time tomorrow in my more technical talk using more principled models from uh, human behavioral ecology uh, to determine how, when and why people might behave as conservationists. And by conservationists, I mean incurring short-term costs for longer-term benefits. So I'm not going to talk about that more. The second idea is that biological diversity enhances cultural diversity. And the idea here is that with multiple niches, uh, these multiple niches provide um, an environment in which you can get diversification of human cultures. And this is pretty unlikely since human niches are shaped much more by technology um, than by the environment. And in, uh, we, this is a, a topic actually that um, was referred to partly in Eduardo's talk about uh, uh, Stewart's cultural, cultural ecology model where he places a lot of emphasis on the sort of the lens of technology uh, filtering the effects of the environment on what people actually do. So, for example, in Mali, uh, there are many cultural groups living in the relatively homogenous uh, Niger Delta as a result of entirely different technological specializations. Uh, so fishers, cattle keepers, uh, camel keepers and farmers, they all use the same environment, but in very different ways. So, you know, generally, we're not particularly uh, convinced of the second hypothesis. And the third is, is probably the most reasonable, that both uh, biological and cultural diversity are either enhanced or depressed by some additional determinants. And uh, here, this is uh, something that has been looked at um, an, a number of times, but this study um, it produced particularly nice clear figures. So this is some work by uh, Moore et al, uh, where they basically took data on um, two degree cells uh, across sub-Saharan Africa, and then plotted onto this species diversity and linguistic distribution. So for every cell, you could see how much diversity there was. And what they find, they have this measure climate one, which is, is basically a principal component. Um, it's sort of think of it as wetness and warmness. And what you can see is that if you're looking at uh, species uh, diversity on the left here, basically climate is a much better predictor here. You can see the different uh, regression coefficients is much better, um, oh, not the regression coefficients, the, the amount of variance explained. Um, climate is a much better predictor than uh, language. And when you go here and you're then looking at language diversity, again, you can see that climate is a better, uh, up here, climate is a better predictor, or somewhat better predictor. The difference there is not so great. And so, um, it you probably, uh, I mean, I think this kind of work could actually be done in, in much more detail now and, and probably is something one would want to do in, um, you know, more local areas. Uh, but it suggests that, that independent factors are important. And we could think, you know, other potential, uh, other potential, oh. Yeah, uh, other potential predictors of biodiversity and cultural diversity uh, will be conquest, human expansion, or colonial invasion. Uh, so typically high biodiversity environments, so for example, moist tropical forests, are not very conducive to intensive agriculture because of poor soils and risk of disease and pests. And therefore, these, ha these areas inhibit the spread of monolingual states um, and colonizing empires, uh, which are, of course, dependent on surplus food production to finance um, occupational specialization. 
regulation and their bureaucracies. And conversely, um, biodiversity, low biodiversity zones, for example, grasslands are much easier for these kinds of states um, to, to enter into uh, because they can, uh, it's, it's easier to produce a lot of food there and sort of base your empire out of there. And just to sort of drive this point home, um, think of the colonization of South America. You know, where did the, the um, uh, Spanish go? They went up into the mountains. You should think about where the Spanish settled. Uh, they settled not in the, the um, sort of Amazonia Oriente area, but in the highland areas where they could produce more food to, to support their forces. And of course, it's uh, the same in East Africa and the colonial Germans and English uh, mainly settled themselves in the higher grounds uh, where typically there was less biodiversity, although not, not always. So, um, Oh yeah, and just, just to complicate it even more, this is a map um, from Schwarzman about uh, how uh, it's kind of turning it all around upside down um, in that indigenous people um, themselves here are protecting their land uh, extremely well. Up to the next button, which is going to be uh, traditional ecological knowledge. This consists of all local knowledge passed from generation to generation that typically encodes local knowledge for garnering food, medicine, shelter and tools. And uh, the anthropologists together with ethnobotanists and ethnozoologists have been at the forefront of demonstrating the value of this knowledge, allowing people not only to hunt, gather and survive as foragers, but also to bro broadcast seeds and to protect their diseases, their, their, their plants, uh, their favoured plants from diseases as well, of course, maintaining densely productive multi-species gardens that can assure uh, food throughout the year and food protected from disease. We saw a picture of, of um, Harold Conklin, um, who, who was one of the people who really uh, pushed this idea of the importance of traditional knowledge in maintaining these very complex Sweden gardens that we see in many parts of the, of the wet tropics. And the, the reasoning uh, for protecting all, all of these species and uh, is that it's partly to assure food and, and just to, to basically to, right, to assure food and survival um, and, and to control pests, but also to propitiate uh, spirits and to maintain sort of good relationships with the uh, sort of um, unseen forces in, in the environment. So uh, the, the idea of traditional ecological knowledge became extremely popular amongst anthropologists and also has attracted a lot of conservation scientists uh, who, for example, as, as you see here in this paper by Colding and Folk, uh, they did, well, one, of, one component of traditional ecological knowledge is this idea of taboos, that certain species should only be harvested at certain times or they should be entirely protected. And uh, so what Colding and, and, and Folk did is, is an analysis of where these taboos are most prominent across uh, different species and then noticed that these were also uh, the species that were most likely to be listed as threatened by IUCN. And uh, so you can see that, that uh, what is it, 44% of mammals uh, have, uh, this, this is data from a while ago and I'm sure this could be updated, but you know, a large percent of the mammals uh, that are threatened are also, um, note, uh, also protected through taboos, uh, less so with birds, but, but we see the same pattern with, with, with reptiles. And so this kind of led to a whole sort of narrative that, that traditional ecological knowledge is incredibly important and conservation biologists really need to pay attention to it. And I, I certainly don't want to um, challenge this uh, sort of seriously, but I, I do want to make some kind of um, some provisos or at least some cautions about uh, the role of traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, first of all, uh, certainly no anthropologist today nowadays would see uh, traditional ecological knowledge as static or frozen in time. And as uh, Smith and Wishney, which was the, the reading that I, I put for, for this particular lecture, uh, as they pointed out, human groups have moved around over much of history um, for, uh, and so, you know, Groups are having, populations are having to update their information, they're having to revise it, they're having to move to new areas, learn new knowledge. So this idea that, that you know, this knowledge has been around forever is probably somewhat of a, of a, a sort of a, a false, false belief. Uh, secondly, um, it seems to me that the value of traditional ecological, or the value, value of any knowledge varies enormously with scale. So 
as communities are impacted by outsiders, they're going to need very different kinds of knowledge uh, than when they're living in, in the sort of way that we wrongly imagine they used to live in these totally sort of encapsulated uh, kind of unaffected uh, sort of environments. But so it becomes increasingly important for, uh, I, I would think, it, well, certainly the, the people where I work in Tanzania, it's just as important to know how to deal with lawyers and the government, uh, the government bureaucracy to uh, avoid either loggers or hunters coming into their area than it is to be able to uh, follow the, the tracks of a certain kind of game animal. And so, you know, this knowledge really needs to change. And similarly, of course, as global changes in climate occur, uh, new need knowledge is, is needed um, to deal with the sort of uh, different scale of, of, of inputs that are, that are occurring. So the real challenge for communities is to integrate outside scientific knowledge into their traditional systems. And at the same time, for outsiders, people who are developing conservation or sustainability interventions, to find ways to uh, integrate their knowledge with the traditional knowledge so that a, a more sort of synthetic understanding can be, uh, can be sort of reached and a more appropriate education. And for this reason, I, I find you know, many sort of conservation interventions that focus on environmental education um, can really be uh, extremely sort of, uh, they look very colonialist and, and, and very arrogant uh, because the assumption is, is that education, most of the education should come from outside. But on the other side, as anthropologists, we should not be rejecting it because the scale issues mean that a lot of this outside information does need to be paid attention to. So the punchline here is don't believe everything you read uh, from anthropologists about traditional ecological knowledge and be very careful with the promotion of environmental education. Back to the buttons, the tragedy of the commons. <laughs> so you've all undoubtedly heard of the tragedy of the commons model and I don't want to spend much time on this today. Um, I'm going to examine it a little more as a basis uh, for, to examine, uh, as, for, uh, in the context of examining the theoretical basis of cooperation uh, tomorrow when I talk. But very briefly, the tragedy of the commons model depicts a scenario where individuals are unwilling to pay the costs of conservation, whether it's reducing fertility, limiting their herd size, um, or stinting, uh, restraining on, on prey capture, because the benefits of doing so are shared collectively, um, whereas the uh, costs are incurred privately. Um, so you're only going to basically benefit if, if everybody does it. So this is a, obviously a classic collective action problem. And just to remind, uh, I thought I had a figure of it. Uh, well, so, the, so in terms of the red button, um, I often get students coming to see me from ecology and evolutionary, uh, from people in the ecology or evolution program, that are saying, hey, what's going on with tragedy of the commons? I hear you anthropologists don't believe in it. Well, the point is not that. The point is that um, anthropologists, uh, it's not that we don't believe in it. Um, it's that anthropologists um, don't challenge, the, we don't challenge the logic of the model, but what, and I think Bonnie will obviously talk about more of this tomorrow, but what we've made a big deal of is that Hardin failed to recognize the distinction between situations involving open access, which is the absence of any property rights, um, and those of communal ownership or communal management. And this is a point that's been made many, many times now. And so as Hardin regretfully um, noted, uh, you know, long after his original uh, famous paper, that, oh dear, you know, if only I'd just written about the tragedy of the unmanaged commons, you know, all of this fuss that has really used so much ink, um, you know, could have been avoided. So, um, and... Yeah, I have a, a picture here of Netting's work just to, uh, this, paper, this book has been referred to before, but it's a, a wonderful analysis of um, the sort of management of the commons, how it changes over time. So commons can be managed by communities, and obviously a very interesting literature has developed, developed around this sort of institutional economics and the whole um, Ostrom workshop that I'm sure we're going to come back to um, at various points in, in the next couple of days. <laughs> Uh, but the, the main point that I want to make here is that probably um, the, 
the problem that we face is maybe not so much the difficulties that communities face in managing their natural resources. Um, and I'm going to talk much more about that, actually, in my lightning talk on, on Wednesday. But rather, the elimination of small-scale uh, systems of common property management uh, under the pressure of what uh, Smith and Wishy called the two juggernauts of centralized government and expanding commercial interests that often work in collusion, um, which undermine local resource management systems. And this is really where I know that Eduardo's work goes in this direction, and this is really something that, of course, we're, we're all having to address now, rather than just focusing, focusing on the communities themselves. So that's all I have to say on the tragedy. Of the oh, yeah. Oh, well, that, so here was just a plug for my own work. I know we're not really supposed to be talking about our own work, but uh, uh, this was the book that I referred to briefly this morning, but one of the... Uh, issues uh, about uh, when communities are trying to defend their land from outsiders or from uses that they don't approve of uh, is that they need to still feel uh, connected to the land that they were maybe excluded from. And so this is a book that, that we did uh, for the communities in Western Tanzania and Pimbwe, uh, adjacent to what is now Katavi National Park. Uh, to based on all kinds of trips we did with elders, we did with kids, we did with women, into what is now the park of sites of their old villages so that they could, you know, really kind of get a sense, of, wow, we did live here, and oh, my grandfather told me about that, my granny told me about that, and to engage them more in the decisions that are mainly being made by the central government now, um, but into which they could have more input if they were more motivated to do so. So the goal here was try to reignite a sense of place uh, among these communities. Okay, next button. <laughs> Well, somebody wants a different one. This is protected areas. So this is not the time or the occasion to talk about protected area management in general, only to note that over the last 30 or so years, the pendulum has swung back and forth amongst conservation scientists and social scientists over the merits and demerits of setting land aside. These are the kinds of things we used to argue about a lot around the campfire and in the villages around Mpimbwe. So what can anthropologists bring to this? Well, the first question about protected areas is, what do we, uh, oh, this, this actually is just a picture, I think, of the, um, yeah, this is just a picture of, of, of the kind of um, back and forth uh, books uh, of people in support of protected areas and critiquing protected areas. And just to illustrate um, how, how there have been such diverse views. And many of these books, well, they're all great books, but uh, many of them are, are very strongly driven by ideology uh, rather than actual data. And I find this very frustrating. And I'll, I'll come back to this uh, at the end. But the first question that anthropologists bring to this is, what are we actually protecting? And, and why are we conserving it? And here you can see the golden plains of the Serengeti. But actually, historical ecology tells us that what we're really conserving here is a construction of the 19th century. These, uh, many of these large grasslands in, in East Africa were a product of the rinderpest uh, epidemic that led to a very, very high mortality of livestock, uh, uh, cattle, and also wild animals, and uh, led to depopulation of the area, hotter fires, and then these uh, open grasslands emerging from it. So what we kind of think of, you know, this sort of idyllic out of Africa, you know, Meryl Streep wandering around, oh, wow, this is where we evolved, uh, isn't, wasn't like that at all. Uh, so, you know, why, the, and this speaks to a deeper question of what are we conserving, which part of the historical landscape do we, do we conserve, why are we particularly interested in this particular configuration. So that's one thing that, biology, that, that anthropologists bring to this. Uh, biologists, of course, see these reserves as critical for uh, protecting biodiversity and uh, ecosystem services, uh, like the Serengeti, again seen here. But anthropologists often view these protected areas as, you know, uh, sort of under the sort of idea of fortress conservation, as either a human rights violation or at least a sort of a cruel exclusion of local people uh, from their homelands, and often as a major cause of poverty. And this has been a huge theme in the literature. So here you can see some uh, pastoralists uh, sitting outside the Serengeti, kind of looking in, maybe you could imagine, sort of long longingly. And finally, 
Um, there are, of course, uh, anthropologists have been strongly involved in the setting up of indigenous reserves, which are protected areas that are managed primarily by the local community that was excluded or that lives there together uh, with the, the wildlife, which is often a, a subject of, of sort of uh, ecotourism. And, but th there are a lot of problems with these kinds of reserves too. You can see this photo was given to me by Bob Hitchcock and uh, it's to depict that uh, the only people who are allowed to hunt in this area are the indigenous communities. This is the Kung, this is the uh, Kalahari, uh, Central Kalahari Game Reserve. But they're only allowed to hunt if they're in their indigenous clothing and with uh, bows and arrows. So, you know, if you're wearing regular trousers, pants, uh, you're, you're not allowed to hunt. And this is clearly uh, really um, you know, a, a pretty shameful system. So, more buttons. Monitoring and evaluation. Yeah, so this is actually a, probably the last one I'm going to talk about. Um, there is a real world out there for anthropologists, and I think Michael was, was saying how important, really, all anthropology is applied now, and I, I, I really agree with that with many respects, at least in this particular area. And, and as anthropologists, we've been drawn in to evaluate the effectiveness um, of different kinds of conservation interventions. And I'm just going to, I'm here going to resort a little bit more to, to things that I've done in this area. Um, but we set up um, something called Savannahs Forever. You can see the band here at the top, uh, which was asked to, we were asked by the president and, and prime minister of Tanzania to certify African trophy hunting to see whether the companies um, were both following the social and ecological uh, principles that they were supposed to be following and that then they would get a certification uh, kind of uh, stamp and they could probably charge more from their hunters and uh, you know the whole business would be cleaned up well i don't have time to go into why it didn't work but um the whole uh, system the, the political system is pretty corrupt and anyhow it didn't work so we ended up with this uh, organization unfortunately called savannah's forever tanzania which is an incredibly sort of colonialistic sounding thing but that was the name we were given for doing the, uh, the certification, and we're kind of stuck with it now. We'd have to pay an awful lot of money to change our name. And we have a big team of Tanzanians who, you know, we were then, we had this organization, basically an organization with no mission any longer because the certification couldn't go forward. So we turned to monitoring and evaluation. And I'm just going to end here with sort of what can, how can anthropologists contribute to monitoring and evaluation? Well, first, first here I put advocacy and I put a minus, and I'm sure this is going to annoy some people. I don't want to say that advocacy is bad, and I have to say I do do it with another hat on, but I think that when we're in collaborations with conservation, people in conservation, agriculture, nutrition, and health, uh, which is what we do in Savannah's Forever, we need to be really careful um, not to get ourselves stereotyped as always taking the predictable line. And so I'm um, kind of, well, if would recommend to you that if you're going to put an anthropologist on your team, uh, choose carefully because you don't want to get yourself into too much trouble. That's not that we shouldn't be activists in other contexts, but I don't think that in the uh, interdisciplinary collaborations it's the right place to do it. One thing we can do is we can bring our holistic um, understanding to the design and monitoring of evaluation that includes not just what the client wants, but also what we think is important. So when we work for like USAID or WWF or IUCN, um, we, we obviously measure everything that they want us to measure, what they're paying for, but I insist that we also measure health things like, like uh, kids' growth, anthropometry, uh, food security, even if their project is not designed to alleviate in, in those domains, because projects can often have unexpected consequences. And the, the sort of, you know, this is where I put the kind of holistic side of anthropology to work. We need to keep our eyes open all the time. We need to be super observant. If they're not willing to pay for that, uh, it's very difficult for us to go ahead with it. And I have two papers here, which I don't have time to talk about in detail, but both of these are sort of scientific papers that have come out of this kind of holistic um, evaluation of the success of different kinds of projects. And uh, finally, as anthropologists, we have a good sense of how social patterns are distributed um, across the landscape and the implications of this heterogeneity for evaluating um, outcomes. And you might think, oh yeah, she's an anthropologist, she's talking about different ethnic groups, different ethnic groups do things differently. But it's not even that, even within one ethnic group, uh, you can find huge heterogeneity. And you've got to be very, I, I don't want to go down the line here, of anthropologists, it's all complex. 
it's not that it's all, it, it is all complex, but we've, we're so lucky now to have amazing statistical models where we can use multi-level analysis, you can have independent uh, uh, intercepts, you can have independent, uh, you can have random intercepts, you can have random uh, slopes, and so you can really start to tease out what are the different factors going on in different communities. And as an anthropologist, I think even those, those methods are not anthropologists, um, we have the eye to sort of examine that heterogeneity across the landscape. And we've done that, um, we've done this in, in this work, well actually the, the, the paper that just came out in, in PNAS, we did it on polygyny, I know you guys aren't interested in polygyny, but we found that, uh, I won't tell you about that, I don't have time, but we, <laughs> we, we also have used that method to look at uh, migration, issues of migration, how uh, if you take a sort of a general average across a whole country, you really might not see a very specific pattern, but if you basically do stratified analyses, you can see some really cool patterns that are incredibly important for implementation of projects. So um, you can see I'm kind of somebody who pushes quantitative methods, but I, 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 I'm not doing it because I think quantitative methods are necessarily the best way of doing things, but I think we can use it to use them to explore the complexity and heterogeneity that anthropologists are often sort of, you know, accused of, uh, of pushing, but we can then use those methods to try to tease out what's really going on in these different communities. And I think I'm just going to jump to the uh, very end. I was going to talk about some um, comparison work. Uh, I know somebody asked a question at the beginning. Whoever it was asked a question about uh, how we do comparative work at global scale. Uh, we've done a lot of this. We had a, a paper a few years ago um, trying to examine what works and what doesn't work um, and doing a multi-level analysis here, so looking at national level factors, looking at project features, or looking at community features, and really trying to see, you know, what, what is the story here? You know, is everything affected by the national level institutions, or how important is the design of the project? Um, how important are the features of the community itself? And I'm, I read the, the papers that Eduardo circulated, and uh, he looks at these same things, and he does it in a much more dynamic way, because he's interested in the sort of how these different levels affect each other. We couldn't do, we only had a sample of 136, so we couldn't do the interactions between all these levels. But, uh, so we have a more mechanical approach, but I still think it sheds uh, a lot of light. But I don't have time to tell you about it, it doesn't matter. I'll just go to my conclusions, which are, um, take an anthropologist, we're okay, you know. It's <laughs> Beware of excess advocacy, um, and actually that's as much of a caution for conservation scientists. I'm thinking about my husband saying protected areas are great, a bit like, like Paige. There's certain things we can't talk about in our house. Um, incorporate import, important features of the community or, or important features of community or individual well-being um, into any kind of monitoring you do, even if it's not the goal of the project itself because of these um, unexpected consequences. Um, embrace complexity. Complexity is great, but think of ways of doing it analytically. And watch out for all those red buttons. Thanks very much. <laughs>